Anybody got anything they want to talk about today? Too? Anybody got any thoughts? Concerns? Rebukes? What do they, what do they say in Seinfeld for Festivus? I got a lot of problem with all you people, and I'm going to tell you about it today. <laughs> I was not the exact opposite. Yeah, well, you know. You know it's like, blessed of everybody. I did have some with all these people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's also a chance to, you know, yeah, help you challenge or rebuke anything you hear me say or question it or dissect it or, you know, anything like that yeah, or yes. any thought. I do, and I don't have my phone with me, but is the verse in the Bible, uh, I was reading Genesis and, gosh, I, I had a Bible on me. There's a problem with this church. It's it's when they're, um, it's like yeah, a tree yeah, of life. Um, it was when they were kicked out of it was when they were kicked out of the garden. Oh, man, let me, let me think about yeah, this. Yeah. I really was struggling with this. Twist, I, I'm going to find twist it. Through yeah. 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 Twist through that. Twist through that. Anybody else have anything while she looks through that? I'll be back. I'm going to go. Anyone? We're all just feeling peaceful. Anyone? Well, I mean, I always had one. Like, no end to that, but I will start to pray. I'm just trying to defer the floor before I become like a wind up dog. I'll throw something up. You've talked about this a lot for different angles, and it goes to the issue of um, living out of passion. And how do you live out of passion? And how do you avoid, or how, do you, how, how does that become? Conflated with this uh, religious uh, lie that God's calling you to do something for Him, and so and because those two can get mixed very easily. Yes. Yeah. Um, I thought one of the big uh, disservices to really anybody who got exposed to it was this whole uh, uh, Rick Warren uh, mm -hmm. nonsense of uh, the purpose of the church. Yeah, it, 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 it was just a uh, means by which to continue to brainwash people that we're to be God's servants as opposed to being the apple of his, his eye and those whom he has chosen to serve with his life for eternity. So uh, I'd like to hear more about that just to be reminded. I've been thinking that uh, one of the great things about being freed by the truth is you get to do what you want to do. Now, people may hear that and think, ah, you get to go sin. No, that's not what I'm talking about. That. And you all know I'm not, I'm not talking about that. Would, would you, does God get to do what he wants to do? Okay. Does he sin? No. So if you're the God kind uh, and you're to live his life with him, do you get to do what you want to do? Yeah. Well, it follows that, yeah. <laughs> the logic follows. Yeah, that's so, uh, and in that, you can be like full bore passionate about it, but you're not working. Yeah, but you're not working. Laboring. Yeah, right. you're not toiling. Rick yeah. Warren's it's book a joy. was one of the best books I ever had because I kept it on my um, uh, coffee table on purpose, and people would look at it and say, oh, I read that book. And then, so that would strike the conversation <laughs> <laughs> of freedom versus doing instead yeah. of being. Yeah, yeah, doing instead of being. Yeah. And it's like, does, does, God, does God serve us? Yeah. But does he do it because he has to? Mm -hmm. Or does he do it because he's passionate yes. in his heart about us? Yes. Right? right? Why is he doing what he's doing? Is he doing it because he read the book called The Purpose Driven Life? And he said, my goodness, look at me. I have so much. What's my purpose? Yeah. And then he found his purpose and he started doing it. I mean, what we want to understand is that we're so much like God that we want to take concepts that we've been taught and have read or been persuaded of in the church. What we immediately want to do is take them and put them on to God and see if that same idea makes sense with God. If it doesn't make sense with God, then it's telling you there's something off about it, right? There's some part of its presentation that isn't exactly right. And so if things like the purpose-driven life, if that doesn't jive with God, then neither should it be able to jive with us. And that means that, it doesn't mean that the guy's had a malicious intent. It just means that his way of trying to explain something ain't exactly right. It means that his desire for something to come forth 
hasn't come from the Spirit. It's come from his own lust to bring it forth. And this is the way we're going to bring it forth. And this is common to all humans. Right? It's common to all humans. Something that we do a lot in the church. I'm going to talk about it today with what it means to make Jesus Lord of your life. Or Lord over your life. Something we do a lot is we confuse the fruit that comes forth from something with the thing itself. Right? Like, for, if I, for me to make Jesus Lord over my life, if I'm really having Jesus Lord over my life, that will produce love in me. And you could see me loving people. But the, the loving you see me doing towards people, that's not me making Jesus Lord of my life. Right? And so what we do is we, we, we see that a person who's filled with God, the fullness of the Godhead, they could be out there doing all kinds of things. They could be out there ministering to people, serving people, uh, blessing people, praying for people, feeding. They could be out there doing all these kinds of things. And then we define that as what it means to serve God, right? Like you could look at me and say, oh, you started the church, you minister all the time, you're serving God. No, those things are not me serving God. Those things are the fruit of God having served me, right? And we ought not to confuse the two. My purpose is... My purpose for existing is not to have this church. My purpose for existing is not to preach. That's not why God made me, right? We should never confuse our purpose with our passion. And we should never let the two get crossed over. It will rob us from enjoy enjoying our passion, and it will rob us from living out our passion. In fact, we could even be busy with something that outside of the heavy burden, we might actually enjoy and never be able to enjoy it at all. Right? Because of we've confused it with our purpose. This is what I'm here for. This is what God made me to do. This is his will for my life. If it crosses over into all that, woe is you eventually. Woe is you eventually. Because you're going to feel empty, broken, used, forsaken, abandoned, all those kinds of things. Right? And so we want to see a separation there. God's will for your life is real clear. His purpose for your life is real clear. Unless you can define God's purpose for your life outside of time, you're not on the right track. Okay? God's purpose for your life involves eternity, not just this world. And now what we come and do is we're in a world where there is time, and we try to define God's purpose for our life within the constraints of this world. And we get it completely crooked. So God's purpose for our life is an eternal purpose. And what he's thinking that his will for our life is, is that we would live and not die. And that he could spend all his days pouring himself out for us and providing his life for us and filling us full of his abundance, his love, his peace, his joy. His purpose or his will for your life is that you experience the fullness of all that he is inside of human flesh for all eternity. Your purpose is to love and to feel love back out of your heart towards him. That's your purpose. Period. That's not to be confused with what you do. Right? That's not to be confused with what you might be passionate about. And that's what can really hinder passion. Right? Where we confuse it with our purpose. And also if we begin to look to our passion. And what we can do with our passion. As the means by which we can feel satisfied. Or the means by which we can find contentment. Or the means by which we can say our life is okay. Yeah. Our life is good. And the lie is if you don't see the fruit as the outcome of your, your passion, then you conclude that you're failing in your purpose. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is damaging. And it will fill you with bitterness. Listen, you'll start to think. Listen, if you think God's mind is filled with you performing some service, listen, man, you're going to end up feeling used by God. It's what's going to happen. And you can just look at it in a human relationship, right? You end up feeling used by people, right? You end up, if, if a person only values you for what they can get you to do for them, Unless you're really walking with God and you're so satisfied by God, you're going to eventually feel used by them, unappreciated by them. You're going to eventually feel like, do they even consider that I'm a person with feelings? I mean, do they even see me as a person? Or am I just like some slot machine or some computer that they can come to for answers, that they can come to to get what they want out of me when they decide they want it? Do they even realize I also have feelings and emotions? 
That's what it will, will lend itself to. So when we're talking about purpose, you want to close the book on what that means. The reason God formed you in your mother's womb when he was busy thinking of you before he even formed you in your mother's womb, before he even made creation, when he was busy in his brain, in his heart, um, imagining and dreaming of how cool it would be to hang out with you and to play patty cake with you and to play in the sandbox with you and to watch you grow and to fish with you and to hike with you. When he was busy thinking all those things, his mind was not filled with what you could do for him or what you could do to advance the kingdom. That's not what his mind was filled with. God, listen, God don't think like us. He's not busy thinking, will the kingdom advance? <laughs> he, he's not. He's not busy thinking, how are we going to get the kingdom to advance? He's not busy thinking that. He's He's busy knowing the spirit. My spirit is going to advance the kingdom. My spirit will make manifest the kingdom in people and in the earth. And he's, the spirit is not like a, a bad employee to God. That on the spirit's last employee <laughs> review, he got unsatisfactory remarks. Right? God's not busy wondering, well, can the spirit get it done or not? <laughs> and so when God thinks about the kingdom being brought forth, or the kingdom being ministered, or the kingdom manifesting, yes, humans can be animated by his spirit and come alongside him and declare what he's busy doing. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can do that, but we ought not to confuse that with God sitting on the sideline wondering how it's going to happen and that it can't happen unless we do what he wants him to do. And so his mind isn't filled with our mm -hmm. service towards him. That doesn't mean we won't end up doing things. Those of you that know me know I'm always doing things. I don't even have a free moment to even try to write a book. <laughs> you know how many people message me and tell me to write books? I'm like, yes, I know. I, I write much better than I talk. <laughs> or it's easier because you can go back and read it over and over and over again. But I don't even have time for that. I'm not serving God. <laughs> Right? I've been animated by the Spirit of God, and I find my heart bustling over with a passion. Paul would describe it this way. I've been arrested by the love of Christ mm. for all people. Mm. That's the foundation from where what he did was born. It wasn't born from God coming and saying, listen man, this is what I made you to do. It was born from him being arrested by the love of God for all people. Mm. And that took him captive. And he got the most enjoyment out of life going and telling people about that. Right? That's why he did it. It gave him a buzz. Mm. He wasn't sitting on a rock one day and saying, what's my purpose? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, my purpose must be that I have to go do this. This is no um, trivial matter. Um, Paul... Um, writes about it and says one is the law or carnal is death. It will always call to death to you. Yeah. Um, where uh, grace will this is not, this blows my mind. I, I think I read it in your book last night. I think you used it as one of your uh, uh, illustrations in the scripture. It says we'll give you glory. We'll give me glory. We'll give you glory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, yeah, huge. They will. And, gl and life, of course, but glory. Glory is life. Yeah. 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 It, it's like what Paul comes and says in Romans uh, 12, to present yourself a living sacrifice. Listen, he's not telling you to go find some service to perform. That's not what it means to be a living sacrifice. Remember, Paul's also the guy that said, I was crucified with Christ. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I'm still alive. Mm -hmm. So when he says to consider yourself a living sacrifice, he's telling you to let your mind be filled with the knowing that you were crucified with Christ. The power behind your life is no longer your own strength. The power behind your life is the very life of God. And as you go forth in the earth, let your mind be filled with the knowing that you've been filled full with the life of God. Then he starts talking about different things people might be passionate about doing in the body of Christ. Right? Right? He says, let those things be born of faith and not of sin. <coughs> what would sin be? And how does that fit with our definition of sin? I know not us in this church, but in the church worldwide, what does that mean? Don't be an administrator and also be committing sin? Don't be a preacher and be drinking all the time? 
No, he says, let what you do not be born from sin. Let it be born of faith. And so what is he talking about there? He's talking about whatever it is you do. Let it be born from the foundation of knowing that you ain't doing it to satisfy God or yourself. You ain't doing it to find peace for your life. You ain't doing it to try to find satisfaction. You're doing it out of the foundation of saying, I have all those things already in God. All the peace that I need, I already have in God. The satisfaction I need, I already have in God. The life that I desire, I already have it in God. My cup is already running over. It's been filled full in God. This thing I'm doing over here is towards no end to filling me full. Towards no end to serving me with peace and love and joy. It's to no end towards me getting the Father to smile down upon my life. The Father is not smiling down upon my life because this is what I'm doing. He smiled down upon my life first. And I saw how he smiled upon me. And I saw that his gaze upon me had nothing to do with what I could do for him. And that filled me with the boldness. And it removed fear from my heart and fear from my life. Because if this guy's face is shining down upon me, that means his life is infused into my very being. If his life is infused into my very being, then what can be against me? What can be against me? Now when I think about what's in my heart to do, I'm not going to be busy weighing it out. Will people accept it? Will people like it? Can I make a living? Do do you see how how this goes? Oh, wait one second. Do you see how that goes? And so those things are what would bring fear, doubt into the picture. Those things are what would bring confusion. Those things are what would make you feel weak and fragile in the midst of trying to live out your passion. All those things. Because I tell you what, if I started the church, and I, I mean, God had to walk me out of a lot of this. If I started the church hoping to be made whole or to find fulfillment out of starting the church, Mm. Where are you at if things don't look right? Mm -hmm. Where are you at if people don't receive your word? Mm -hmm. We see where that was at with Paul. Because Paul kind of had the thing confused. Right? When he called himself a servant, he just meant one sent with the word of God. What he meant was, listen, I have been acknowledged by God as one possessing the gift of understanding all mysteries. And I have been uh, commissioned by God to express his gospel when he called himself a servant. But where was Paul at when the Judaizers were upending all of his churches? Paul's thorn. He cried out to God thrice. Why? Because he was feeling lack. See, he was looking to how his passion went to find fulfillment or to find a word about his life. And so here he was passionate. You feel real good about your passion at first. Everybody knows that, right? You feel like gangbusters. Mm. I'm about to attack this thing. On the, what we don't really want to acknowledge is on the far side of that thought is all we can get from it. All the good that can come from it. If we attack our passion, what can we gain? What can we have? Right? You, the gospel will bring you to the place where you count all things as lost. You count everything you could gain as dumb. The, it's removed from your mind. You can't really live by passion if your mind is filled with what you can gain from your passion. You can't. That's no longer passion. That's attaining to. That would be sin and not faith. Right? Faith is I've already I've, I've already apprehended that which, that which I was apprehended for. Paul talked about God coming to apprehend him for something. And I promise you he wasn't talking about God coming to apprehend him so he could be an apostle. He was talking about God apprehending him so he could have eternal life and live and not die. Right? I've already attained to that. And that's designed to fill you full. And if you're thinking your passion, if your mind is filled with what you can gain from your passion, that passion is going to be choked out. Right? Mm. It's going to be confused and choked out. So Paul, thrice he calls out to God. He's full of a passion to see the gospel preached and people saved and, and the churches to be formed. And he sees his churches and all the good work he did all being upended. And he's confused, and he's thinking, what the hell, God? Did you really call me to do this? You see how you start to get confused? Mm-hmm. If you're busy looking at finding fulfillment in your passion, the second it goes wrong, you start thinking, well, did God have me to do this, or did I do it myself? <laughs> did I get it all wrong? God, what the hell? 
And he goes back and forth, back and forth. And then he gets a revelation. Jesus comes and says, Paul, listen, the power behind your passion is not how it goes with your passion. The power unto you, walking out your passion, is not you, look, you looking at how it's going and finding strength for how it's going. The power behind your passion is my life. You're a living sacrifice, remember, Paul? You were crucified with me. The power behind your life is no longer the world and how it goes in the world with your passion. The power behind your life is my passion for you. The power behind your life is my life. It's my arm. It's my arm upholding you in the midst of this. Not how it goes. Not what the world thinks. Not whether the world agrees. Not whether the world grabs a hold of it. None of those things. Paul's like, oh man, then when I'm busy feeling weak, because it doesn't look like it's going well with my passion, I'm actually filled with your strength. Your strength is actually present in me, even when I feel weak. When we all feel weak, we think that means strength is absent. Doesn't it? Yeah. But that's a lie. Because the strength behind your life isn't your own strength anyway. So if you feel weak, how can that mean your strength, that strength is absent? The strength behind your life comes from God. God's never absent. And so when you feel weak, it doesn't mean strength is absent. It means that something is trying to get you to look at your own ability. And every time you look at your own ability, I hate to break it to you, you will feel weak. Mm. <laughs> you will feel weak. You know why? Because your ability is as dumb. <laughs> towards the end of satisfying you, towards the end of exalting you, towards the end of feeling you full of strength to accomplish your passion, mm. it's dumb. Right? And so... What we want to see about that is if we go to make our passion, we've got to find our passion so we can find fulfillment. Listen, I don't disparage the people that did this. People grasp for God like they grasp for straws. And I, I fully believe people do these things grasping for God. Mm. But they haven't heard because they haven't, a preacher hasn't come to them yet. Right? But we, we've handed out a personality tests. Mm. So we can all find what our purpose is in the church. And we can do it. And we can find fulfillment that way. <laughs> right? I mean, honestly, that, that, that's what we did. Listen, man, that's corrupt and that's crooked. Because the moment you look to, and we thought, once we, can find, once we can find our purpose, then we'll feel happy, we'll feel fulfillment. Mm. And actually, it's a pitiful substitute. It's a pitiful, su it's a pitiful substitute. Right. And if... If we confuse it that way, we're going to feel weak all the time. And we're going to feel frustrated. Because we're still going to have a burning in our bones for our passion. But we'll never find the power to actually live it out. Right? And we'll feel empty. Or, 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 or put it another way, we'll, we'll never be free to live it out. We'll never be free to live it out. Yeah. Go ahead. I, you probably forgot what you wanted to say. No, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay, because I track with you. Um, this goes back to about five minutes but. You know, the world would say it's all in your head, and we would say in the circle maybe it's all in your heart. Mm. It's, it's how you see things. I was coming down the stairs, and I wrote yeah, this little bank building, some of y'all know, and it's creaky, and some people say, oh, they got ghosts in there. When I heard it creak, I said to myself, go ahead and creak. I got the Son of God in me. Mm. <laughs> in other words, it's a matter of what is it, what's, what persuasion, true or false, is at, at, in operation in your heart. And, you know, it's tempting to listen to you, and the carnal mind is thinking, how do I accomplish that? <laughs> and I know you're not espousing yeah. that, but that's just the default carnal thinking. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. It's almost like when Paul said, I've been arrested by the, the love of God for all mankind. I used to hear that as, Paul loves everybody, why don't I? <laughs> 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 that is not what it's saying. Right, right, right. right. It's, it's talking right. about God's love for all of mankind yeah, and how right. that affected Paul in his heart who used to kill the Christians. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> tie, tie in the part where, where Jesus is, is, is actually going out with declaring the, the, the good news and he goes, this is the food that you don't know of. Well, the meat. Right. Right? Right, right. I mean, the, the kingdom of God is actually talking about eternal life. Right? Right. Sin and death being removed. Right? So if you go and tell people about that, that is good food. That is food that will strengthen people. Right? Like you eat it, you feel strong. Right. Like when I was a... The only food. That's the only food. Yes. When, I was a, when I was a runner, and I'd run like 150 miles a week. 
Listen, man, there were some days where I felt like I was going to die. Like, every Saturday, I'd go run 26 miles, just a tempo run. Mm. 26 miles every Saturday. <laughs> now, I still ran a, another 125 the rest of the week. So yeah. it wasn't like I was just, that was the only run. By the, and I did that at Washington Park, and it's a lap, three-mile lap. So I had to run it, like, nine times. Towards the last, like, three map, laps, man, I had lost so much water weight that I literally felt like I was going to die sometimes. And I could barely get to my car and drive to this place called Ralberto's to get a breakfast burrito. People in Louisiana don't know nothing about breakfast burritos. They're not anywhere. But that thing had like potatoes and meat yeah. and eggs. It was this big gigantic thing. And you go to the drive thru and there's like two dollars for this thing. And I'm in the car like I'm about to die. And I get my hands on that thing and I eat it. Like immediately I felt strong again. Like you could feel the nutrients oozing through your pores. And so that's what Jesus is talking about, right? It's like when he stood up in John, I am the bread of life, mm -hmm. right? If you feed on the word that's in him, if you feed on the life that's in him, if you see that his life is the rule or the government that is over you, that will make you strong. It'll make you like Popeye. It's like Popeye when he ate spinach, right? The gospel is like handing people spinach. It's like if you got a bunch of Popeyes around you, and you come and feed them all spinach. That's what the message of the gospel actually is, right? And so that's, that's what Jesus is talking about, right? Don't, don't fill your belly. Paul called, um, he talked about the circumcision whose gods were their belly. He's talking about their lust, right? Their god was mammon. They were all the time trying to fill their bellies with what they could gain from the world, as if that was the substance that could fill them with nutrients or make them strong. Mm -hmm. But Paul is saying, that's just filler. Right. You ever gone to a bad buffet when you're on the road or something, and you realize afterwards that like, that thing was like, that filler? Yeah. You know how that feels in your stomach? You know how you don't feel good after that? And Paul's saying, these guys are busy trying to fill their bellies with their own works and what they can gather to themselves as the food that can give them life. Mm -hmm. Right? But listen, man, the bread from heaven that's come from heaven is Jesus. And when we begin feeding our bellies, filling our bellies full of the life that was made flesh in him, the word of life, that is not life filler. We feel satisfied. In fact, we feel so satisfied, we don't even feel like we need to eat no more. Our, our bellies don't even growl no more. We find, like, ultimate satisfaction, right? And so it's like, when you realize that there's a system of governance or a system of rule that your life has come under the power of, and that system of rule or governance is the eternal life that is in Christ, you start to feel strong, right? You start to feel strong. I think it's in John that it says, Jesus said, and this is his commandment, eternal life. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. what yeah. Listen, that's a very profound statement. That is a, an extremely profound statement. And this is his commandment, eternal life. Right? What he's trying to say is that God's got, the world has a system of governance, a system of rule. Right? We have governments in this world, don't we? What do governments do? It doesn't matter what kind. Socialist, capitalist, any kinds of these governments. Protocols. What do, what do they do? They decide they want to bring forth a certain life for the people. That's what they first decide. We want to bring forth a certain life for the people. Then they come up with the idea that they say can give birth to that life. Then they implement it as a system of rule or governance. Like the U.S., we decided that we don't want, we want to take care of the elderly people when they can't work anymore. And so we want to give birth to that kind of a life where the elderly people are taken care of. How are we going to do that? Oh, we're going to implement a system of rule called Social Security. And that system of rule will bring forth the kind of life we want for our people. Right? The kind of life where the elderly are taken care of. So when Jesus comes and say, and this is the Father's commandment, eternal life. He's talking about God's system of rule or governance. <coughs> the commandment is like a law. Right? Social security is law. Mm -hmm. Right? And so Jesus is saying, the law of God is actually eternal life. He's equating it to like the government. And he's saying God first sat in his mind with the idea of the kind of life he wanted for his people. The kind of life where there's no laboring and toiling. The kind of life where they don't feel fear and torment. The kind of life where they're only filled with peace and love and joy. God envisioned this life for his people, and then he came up with a system of rule or governance that can actually bring that forth or give birth to it in the lives of people. 
And that system of rule or governance is the eternal life that is in Christ. That's why Isaiah would come and say, the government is upon his shoulders. Mm. The system of rule is upon his shoulders. It's upon eternal life. And when you start seeing that your life is under the rule of eternal life, and what that means, listen man, you feel strong. Mm. And you, the world, and the strength in the world, the, the, we used to think the world was like a giant. The world becomes real puny and real minuscule, yeah. and you start thinking, Psh, not just bring strong, it. Not just strong, but safe. Strong, safe, all of it. And I just whispered to Lisa, you just have to jump in because he's like a train. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this might go along with these. <laughs> so, um, so there was this verse, I was just going, yeah, I started reading Genesis, and I'm glad this will be in time, but it, I, don't, I don't remember the question in my head why it stumped me, but if I read it, maybe I will. Um, it's three... Chapter 3, verse 23. Mm -hmm. It's a small print. Um, the Lord God said, Since man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not reach out and also take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God sent him away from the garden even to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove man out and east, um, and east of the garden of Eden. He stationed the cherubim with a flaming well, so blah, 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 blah. But, okay, so my... I was reading that and I was thinking, okay, wait, if why did he send them out? You know, I mean, I've read that a million times and I, I was like, kept, I mean, I even started Googling it and, and I was like, so I stopped reading because I'm, when I get to something like that, I can't go on. I have mm -hmm. to like figure that out. <laughs> and I mean, I, you know, when I used to read that, I used to think, well, he sent man out. You know what they did? They did what he didn't want them to do. So yeah. he sent them out yeah, and yeah. punished them. Right. You know, that's what I was told all my life. <laughs> They're not getting that tree of life. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense because that's not what he wanted for them. But then why did he not keep them there so that they could have the tree of life? Even I, I was just stumped. And then I, I read several commentaries where, you know, God, uh, it, he didn't want them to despair, basically. He was doing that so that they can find eternal life through the seed. Of Christ in some sense of the word. I don't know. I'm sure it's the only way to find eternal life, actually. Yeah. Through Jesus, but but I, yeah. I, like, I still don't get that. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. stumped why he sent them out. Yeah, man has become like one of us knowing good and evil. Right. Okay, so he's talking about man being intimate with something to the degree of having become one with them. And the, the best way you can describe it is um, like you and Thomas. You said, I do. And you, you, there was an intimacy when you said I do. That, and, she, and she tells me what to do. That, yeah. <laughs> That's how that, works. That, was, that, was, that was so much that you guys were now one flesh. You're one. Right? There's actually no opportunity for you guys to no longer be one flesh apart from one of you passing away. Right? right. Okay, so Adam and Eve, when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they became intimate with the knowledge of good and evil. They became one with it, or one flesh with it, and the life that it produces. Mm -hmm. So the tree of the knowledge of That's good and evil good. gives birth to death. So now Adam and Eve are one flesh with death. They're one flesh with laboring and toiling. They're one flesh with fear. They're one flesh with all of those things. Okay, A lot of people don't get this far into it, but Satan's end goal wasn't to get them to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was not his end goal. His end goal was to then get them to go eat from the tree of life, right? Because to eat from the tree of life after becoming one with him and his system would be to grant eternity to that. Right. It would be to grant eternity to not just man, but what man is one with now. And so man was one with sin and death, one with fear. One with labor and toiling, one with darkness. If they now come and eat from the tree of life after already being one with that, that doesn't just grant eternal life to them. It grants eternal life to what they're one with, right? And so now man is going to now live eternally in a state of sin and death. And there'll be no opportunity to divorce them from sin and death and no opportunity for them to be married with God, right? Right? And if you read, if you read further in the gospel, did that make sense so far? Well, just for the last part. Um, now they're going to be married to sin and death. They are married to sin and death are. at that point. Okay, right. all right. 
They're intimate with sin and death. Sin and death is their husband. And they didn't want it. They didn't, it would be contaminated if they ate from the tree of life. If they ate from the tree of life, the then their marriage yes. to sin and death would be eternal. Oh, thank you. Eternal. Oh, okay. Okay. There'd be no opportunity for that marriage to be ended. Okay. All right? God's mind's immediately filled with, we got to end this union. We ain't going to bless this union with eternal life. Because we yep. see this union can't bring forth our fruit in our man, who is our Eve. God is Adam, or the husband. We are his Eve. When he looked at us, he said, my goodness, I can bring forth fruit in their lives. I want to be their husband. I want to bear my fruit in them. Right? I want to be one with them. Well, then we became one with something else. Another suitor came and proposed. And we accepted the proposal. And that suitor brings forth death in us. And fear. And labor and toiling. And we're married to that now. And so God says, i got to end that union. And I can't let them eat from the tree of life because then I can't end the union. Now if you jump to Romans 7, Paul talks about the old man having the first die. And he talks about mm -hmm. the, the ceremony of marriage. Mm -hmm. And he says... Should a woman be married to a man, she can't be married to another simultaneously. Her marriage to her first husband must first end in order for her to be free to be married to another. And it says the only way that marriage can end is if there's a death. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that happened at the cross, which is what forgiveness actually means, to put it in layman's terms for this conversation, forgiveness means to end the marriage. Yep. And so when it says that God forgave the sin of the world, it means he ended our marriage to sin and death. How did he end our marriage to sin and death? He became us. And he put on flesh that was married to sin and death. Well, the only way a marriage can end is if you die. Well, here comes Jesus as one of us. We're all in him. He has taken our marriage to sin and death upon himself. Now he gets nailed to a tree and he dies. Guess what? Marriage over. Yeah. Marriage over. Done. Now our woman, now our Eve, now our Eve that we wanted to be joined to, but have been joined to another, my goodness, her marriage is over. Right? It's like if you grew up in high school, this man really digging this girl, and you guys jive, but then you went your separate race somehow, and she ends up marrying somebody else, and you're not married, and you're thinking, man, I've lost her forever. But then by some, you know, catastrophe or something, she ends up free. And you could be thinking, man, she's free now. Right? And so Jesus became a man. It's one of the most powerful reasons why he became a man. Because we were married to sin and death. God had to find a way for us to die without us dying. If you understand what I'm saying. He had to find a way for us to die, but to still be alive to be married. Well, the only way I can do that is if Jesus becomes a man, he takes on their marriage to death on himself, and then he dies. As them and for them. We were baptized into his death. Divorcing us from our union to sin and death. That's why Jesus said, it is finished. And then he gave up the ghost. When he said it was finished, if you read the Gospels, it says the veil was rent from top to bottom. You know what was etched on that veil, embroidered on that gold veil? The two cherubs that Genesis says was marking the tree of life. So he said, it is finished, meaning I died away their union to death. Father, forgive them. He's praying that as he's dying. We about to send sin and death away from them. We about to end their union. Father, send their union to death away from them. In me, it is finished. The veil's torn. Man's not married to anyone now. Now we're free to be, like Paul says, married to another, even Christ Jesus, that he can bring forth his fruit in us. Whereas before, all the fruit that was coming forth in us was the fruit of death. Not because that's what we wanted. We didn't make an intellectual decision that we like the fruit of death, that we want it, that we think it's wonderful. That's not what we did, but we were married to a husband whose seed was death, and his seed brought forth death in us. And so all our fruit, all the fruit that was born in us was the fruit of death. Now, our union to that, we were barren, our union to that is over. Now we're free to be married to another, even Christ Jesus. The gospel is a declaration of God getting down on one knee and proposing. Yeah. I always saw you and loved you. I, when we were in high school... I watched you. I saw you were a cheerleader. And man, I just thought if I could spend my life with you. I, you've always been in my heart. And the gospel is the God declaring that. I always wanted to be your husband. You've always been my Eve. You come forth out of my side. Right. 
Right. Here's the, the passion in my heart. The gospel is him getting down on one knee and proposing. Right? And when you believe, yeah. that's what you're believing. You're believing on him and his love for you. That's really what obedience is. Obedience yes. is to be persuaded of God's love for you and that it's everlasting. And so that's the dynamic there. I've right? never read that commentary. <laughs> <laughs> you can't find that in the book. Yeah. Well, yeah, you can so I didn't read that in the book. <laughs> <laughs> right. I want to go it. on record. That's the best explanation. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
turning his back on that union is him shining his face upon us. It's actually him saying, no, no, no. Their life is so precious to me. I'm jealous over them with a godly jealousy. Their life is so precious to me that I could never go to sleep at night leaving them married to that. And so he hid his face from our union. And that's why the church can get so confused. Right? You can see where it talks about God hiding his face. And if you're not really invested in wrestling with God about what these things mean, if you don't have a gift from the Holy Spirit to discern yep. Yep. All, all mysteries and prophecy, you come out with your own carnal conclusion about it. Yep. It's funny. I hid my face for a little while from you. But with everlasting kindness, I gathered you unto myself. Does anybody else see a contradiction in that verse? <laughs> hiding the face for a little while, but then everlasting kindness. Right. So if the hiding the face was a negative thing, then how could he have everlasting kindness? And when you look at that word everlasting, it means with perpetuity. Mm -hmm. It means without beginning or end. Mm -hmm. It's eternal. So God is saying, I'm filled with eternal kindness towards my man. And because I'm filled with eternal kindness towards my man, I hid my face for a little while from their union to sin and death. So it could be dissolved. He said, well, when did God hide his face? In the Old Testament, when Moses built the tabernacle, wasn't there a veil? How many people could go back there when, when the veil was there? One, once a year. Well, what was behind the veil? God's face. His face would shine behind the veil. And what was God demonstrating? What was he hiding his face from in the law? Man trying to find life by the works of their own hands. He set that whole thing up so man could hear him say, you can never find life by the works of your own hands. The more you try to find life by what you do, by what you get, by what you have, the more it will kill you. And so God wanted us to see that his face was not shining on that system so that we would turn away from looking to that system for life. Right? You know, it's sad how opposite they teach to yeah. church that. And just, yeah. how they, they get it twisted. And yeah. They, Butcher it and twist. make people think, make the world think that you know now you have to do something to earn back God's love and favor because that's what happened to Adam and Eve. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of it's heartbreaking. Uh, uh, at yeah. Mount Sinai, you know, uh, Moses went up to get the the law, and uh, the people tell him, "Look, we're not going to even touch that mountain." But uh, they, he said, "Listen, the nation of Israel said everything the Lord says, we will do." That's what they said. That's what their thinking was. Yeah. And and it perverted the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Right so, from the tree of the And people. what do we say as Christians? Every what it means that Jesus is Lord is everything the Lord says, we'll do it. Yeah. That's what we think. Gotcha. Yeah. And we're we're we we become like God to know good and evil. What was good and evil to God? And you can say a lot of things about this, but I'm starting to see more and more. Good and evil was, it's good to have life, it's evil not to have life. Yeah. There's a knowledge of that. How many of you feel good when you think you don't have life? How many of you feel miserable when you think you don't have life? Do you know why? Because you're living by the knowledge of good and evil. So Adam's mind became filled with the, Adam was naked. That meant he wasn't clothed in God's life yet. But he didn't know that there's a problem not being clothed in God's life yet. He had no knowledge of that. Then all of a sudden he knew it's good to have life and it's evil not to have life. And now all of a sudden he looked at himself and he said, my God, I don't have life. And then he judged that he was evil. And then he judged God must also think I'm evil. And then that took him captive to trying to clothe himself in life. And that's one of the things that messes everybody up so bad in this world. Is we have our, everyone has our own knowledge of good and evil. Thomas and I, we got a different knowledge of good and evil, right? Like, we, we, we might agree about some things, but we'll disagree about some other things. There might be some other things. I think, oh, that's not a problem. And Thomas might think, that's evil. That's not a problem. <laughs> right? That's I like, a sin. I like, the way, I like the way Mo puts it. I'm not acquainted with evil. Yes. I'm not acquainted with evil. Right? But what it, what it does is in this world, there's death. And so we're all the time staring in the face the death. That death is trying to tell us we're evil and not evil. Right. There's something wrong with us that we don't have life, and there's something wrong with God that he hasn't showed up to give it to us. Yes, sir. And now that sends us off to laboring and toiling to gain it for ourselves. Right? And that's what the serpent did to Eve. He come and first suggested, you lack, oh, and also God is lacking. Mm -hmm. God is not as he ought to be as God, mm -hmm. as Father, 
And you don't have what you need. And he didn't give it to you. So that leaves you to get it for yourself. <laughs> the only way you can get it for yourself is to labor and toil. Mm. And now that takes you captive. Right? And so that's what it's talking about there. Adam, that's why it says Adam was naked and unashamed. But then all of a sudden he was filled with shame and fear. He was still just naked. What was the problem? His mind hadn't been corrupted with the knowledge that it's not good to not be clothed in light. Right? Because there was nothing wrong with that at that moment. Because God was there. And God was going to clothe him with life. God knew he was going to clothe Adam with life. He was working to persuade Adam's heart to call out to him for life. Right? That's why when God shows up, God's busy thinking, now you think you're evil and you think I'm evil. Let me show you. Wham! And he clothed it with life, didn't he? Yeah, it wasn't the nakedness that uh, caused Adam to conclude something about himself. It was, it was death. It was the knowledge, yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. Glory to God. You guys rock. Uh, Thank you so much. That was awesome. That was good. <laughs> yeah, man, the gospel is always.